Howdy. I'm Bob Bankin, Spacewalker on STS-130, and you're watching NASA TV. This is Mission Control Houston with a view back inside the International Space Station. The station and Space Shuttle Endeavour crews are working through the first uh, tasks of the day. This view is inside the Unity node. The crew members will be focusing on the beginnings of the internal outfitting for the new Tranquility node that was installed during the mission's first spacewalk. This is a view inside the International Space Station, looking inside the Quest airlock. Astronaut Bob Bankin is there, and he will be joined by astronaut Nicholas Patrick to work on that, those uh, preparation activities for their second spacewalk that uh, will be taking place Saturday evening. As uh, Canadarm2 was used to retrieve tranquility from Endeavour's cargo bay and bring it up to install on the port side of the station on the Unity node, for this operation today, the arm was commanded to release Tranquility now that it is uh, installed on the station. And this free arm is going to rotate around and down to latch onto the grapple fixture on the Destiny Lab. This is a view from a camera on the end of Canadarm2 looking down at the grapple fixture that uh, it will be attached to shortly on the Destiny Lab. This is a view providing an alignment uh, guide for astronauts Terry Vertz and Kay Heyer who are operating the robotic arm. suit experienced an issue with one of the fans operating at a lower speed than expected, which was fine for the first spacewalk, but engineers prefer that a different uh, spacesuit be used as that uh, uh, problem is not understood. The uh, suit uh, originally for Bankin now has the new power harness, and Patrick indicated it checked out okay, and it will... Um, be resized, basically taking the lower torso. On the outside of the International Space Station, the Canadarm2 continues to move into a new position. It will be parked until it is needed for the relocation of the cupola. Cupola is seen uh, covered by uh, some thermal blankets in the lower right corner of this view. 
It will be relocated to the Earth-facing port on Tranquility. This is a live view inside the International Space Station with a camera set up in the Unity node looking towards the new Tranquility node. Crew members are doing the initial setup work to provide some airflow into the new module. Air to ground two. With a temporary ducting. Good, Bob. Air to ground two. Noguchi and Kotov worked on removing that exercise device from its location in Unity earlier because it is in the area where these crew members are working now. So that is why that is the piece of equipment to be moved first into Tranquility. The actual installation of the exercise device will not occur until the next day. The initial setup of that uh, ductwork indicated some airflow readings that aren't as uh, optimum as uh, the team had expected, but uh, calculations indicate that it will work uh, for the time being for the uh, about for four crew members to work inside the module at a time. This is Mission Control Houston with the view inside the International Space Station. Station Commander Jeff Williams is taking the video camera to show Mission Control the uh, setup inside the cupola. Hatch is open there still for the crew members to work on the procedures to get the cupola ready for relocation. He's uh, working on the procedure to install a cover on that uh, hatchway before closing the uh, hatch back up. Endeavour Houston, you guys ready for the event? Uh, Mike, yes, good. Uh, I guess it's good evening to you. Uh, Bob and I are very ready. Uh, first thing is, uh, first question is about the sounds and smells in space. Can you describe how the various parts of the shuttle or the ISS how they smell and some of the sounds that uh, that you hear that might uh, might describe the environment for their for your followers. Well, that's a good question, Mike. Obviously, launch is really noisy, but once you're in space, um, space itself is really quiet. But the inside of the spacecraft um, is never quiet. There's, it's full of fan noise. Um, everywhere you go, there's a fan circulating air because there's no uh, no convection that on Earth is caused by gravity and temperature differences. There's no convection up here to circulate the air for you. So that's the biggest noise we notice. Um, how about smells, Bob? What do you notice up here? Well, I think one of the most uh, remarkable smells that uh, you notice in space, everything smells relatively similar uh, except for food. Uh, and then one other thing, and that, uh, that second thing is the smell that uh, you smell when you actually go into a place that was recently at vacuum. Um, I, I've heard it described as ozone-ish, um, also uh, being attributed to the oxidation of aluminum, but the smell of coming into a, an area that had just been at vacuum, just been at space, uh, is uh, really uh, unique, and I haven't uh, smelled it uh, any place on the ground uh, just uh, coming through the hatch or uh, uh, actually coming back in from an EVA. You can smell the EVA crew members or spacewalkers when they come in. They really have a strong smell, the smell of space. I just can't help to follow up on that question. What, what do you think causes that, that smell of space? What do, you, what do you think it is? You think it's actually space or is it something else? I think the, the smell that you get is actually all the hard work of uh, the spacewalkers who are outside. You know, they spend uh, six or eight hours, uh, like yourself, Mike, uh, eight hours on a spacewalk uh, on uh, the last couple that you had on Hubble. Uh, they spend a lot of time outside working, and you can generate probably a pretty good odor. <laughs> Okay. I have a, a way I like to describe that smell to people, Mike. Okay. Uh, that, that smell to me is to metal uh, what the smell of toast is to bread, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that's what I always thought. It might be some outgassing going on there. All right, thanks very much. That's question number one. Question number two, we're looking for funny moments. Are there any funny moments, particularly after you first get to space? You know, anything, anything unusual, anything funny when you, know, you unbuckle, 
zero G for the first time. What was that like? I think we were both smiling when we unbuckled. Um, uh, the, the funny, the funny things are when when things that you think you had just 10 seconds ago are gone. And, and there's one thing I lost. I still haven't found it five days later. Um, so I, we're too busy to really, really have uh, our humors up at, at full speed. But it is amusing to watch uh, things and people fly around as, as though it were their, their, their first time in a new environment. And for many of us, it, it is the first time in a new environment. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things I wouldn't describe as, uh, you know, kind of funny in the joking sort of a sense, but uh, what was really fun for me uh, on this flight was to see uh, folks get to do things for the first time. And so to see uh, uh, Terry uh, Verts, our pilot, uh, start floating around and try to work his way out of his suit and uh, deal with uh, the challenges of weightness, uh, weightlessness was, a, a, was fun to watch for me, and it was also fun for me to share that experience with him as he uh, went through it for the first time. And for Nick, uh, going out the hatch it was fun for me to watch him go out on his uh, first spacewalk and uh, experience that for the first time so it's not really funny in the comical sense uh, Nick didn't do anything comical during the uh, EVA but uh, it was fun for me to, to be there for the first time a couple of folks got to do those things for both of you can you describe what the earth looks like I mean uh, either through the through the windows of the spaceship is one thing but what did it what was your impressions of seeing it from the spacewalk Well, Mike, I think there's uh, two things that are, are really impressive uh, during the spacewalk. The first one is just the depth of the atmosphere. And so you can see the clouds and the shadow that they cast. I don't know if uh, if you've ever had the experience of uh, being on the ground and then had an airplane fly over you or, or had a, a dense cloud go over you, but uh, that shadow that it cast on the ground, and then that's something that you can really see the depth of the atmosphere and notice how high the clouds actually are. You can also see light you can see cities at night, uh, all that uh, remarkableness that you can look out the window and kind of see through a, just a little small portal. You kind of have the whole horizon out in front of you through your uh, space helmet. And it's, it's really remarkable to just to take that all in. You have to take mental pictures because uh, uh, the, even the cameras that we have uh, don't have a wide enough uh, field of view to, to take uh, all of that in. And, and the other uh, remarkable part of uh, going out for the uh, the spacewalks is is again just uh, thinking about all the people who come together to make make it all possible and so it took it takes a giant team on the ground to get us into space and to make it all happen i know you had a great support team on your previous flights and uh, we've had a huge support team and just to to know all those people are are rewarded and excited by uh, how things are going during the spacewalk is uh, also a, a pretty neat thing it's, it's really hard to describe, Mike. I'll try. Uh, we went out of the hatch in the dark, so I couldn't see anything at first except the underside of Space Station and Endeavour, which were lit in floodlights. And that was beautiful enough. Um, we got working, and at some point uh, in that, I think Steve warned us that uh, our first sunrise was coming up, and I looked towards the horizon, and there was this beautiful blue glow coming towards us. And there isn't much time to watch it, but uh, the once or twice I could watch it during the spacewalk yesterday, uh, it was just amazing. The view is panoramic, as Bob said. You can, in the helmet, you can see so much more than you can through shuttle windows, because you can see almost 180 degrees uh, field of view. Um, but the, the, the blue spreads across the horizon and towards you, and then uh, turns orange and red, and the sun pokes up, and the space station is bathed in a brilliant light. Uh, it all happens extremely quickly, and of course it happens happens 16 times a day, and it's, it's a really stunning sight from anywhere up here, but especially from the inside of a spacesuit. Nice job. It's hard to describe it, but you guys did, did really well. And uh, following up, we have another question related to what you see during a spacewalk. Did you notice any stars while you were spacewalking? did uh, see some stars, uh, Mike, uh, but they are, are so small compared to actually being able to look at the Earth and see the lightning or to see the cities at night. The, the stars are, are uh, actually very dim compared to the lit up space station or the uh, space shuttle. Uh, we did see a very good uh, view of the moon 
And like I said, the cities at night and the lightning show that you get uh, through the atmosphere is uh, just really remarkable. The stars are uh, a little bit tougher to see. You can break out the colors on individual stars, uh, but uh, they're, they're, they're hard to compare to just all you can see on the ground. As uh, Bob mentioned the moon, I did uh, watch um, the moon rise uh, behind Bob uh, yesterday once. It, it came up through the atmosphere. I wasn't sure what I was seeing, but it literally rose through the atmosphere. So it was a white moon behind a, a blue haze. Uh, and then uh, all of a sudden it was up in the clear black of space. And uh, I could tell that it really was the moon I'd been looking at. That was really a remarkable thing to see. But I didn't see any stars yesterday. I'll look for them tomorrow. great descriptions of what you guys saw out there you know it's, it's just an incredible experience and appreciate you sharing that with us and like you said you got a couple more opportunities to make some more memories so uh, great job on your first EVA and good luck on the next couple we'll be watching um, on to a slightly different topic now uh, how are you sleeping how are your sleep patterns up there and uh, how are your dreams affected by being in space Well, uh, sleep patterns aren't affected too much with a couple of exceptions. The first is we have a, a huge, what we call a sleep shift to get here. We needed to launch at 4.30 in the morning, Eastern time. And uh, because of the amount of work you have to do when you get to, uh, to space, uh, it takes about a whole afternoon's worth of work to convert the shuttle into something that's appropriate for living in once you've launched. Um, we needed to make that um, just after our lunchtime. So we were sleep shifted by about nine or 10 hours to achieve that. Um, and that took us a week or two really to get comfortable with that huge sleep shift. And we're still roughly on that sleep cycle, sleeping when uh, people in North America are awake and uh, we're awake when they're asleep. Um, but up here on, on, on station, now that we've adapted to that sleep schedule, we're more or less sleeping normally. There just isn't as much time for it as we'd like. For us, Mike, it was uh, like making a trip to Tokyo uh, right before we launched. And uh, we did a, about three days before the launch, we did the equivalent of uh, transferring to uh, almost uh, Tokyo time, Tokyo, Japan. And, and uh, ha going through that uh, is going to happen on the other end when we come back. So I'm sure we'll not only be tired from the mission, but we'll be tired from those uh, two big uh, sleep shifts, uh, as Nick described, when we get back. Well, you have plenty of time to catch up when you get back to Earth. Uh, another question now comes from uh, the Los Famosos, and I'm probably mispronouncing that, uh, sixth graders at the Sherman Middle School in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. So this comes from a bunch of sixth graders, so be prepared. Uh, they want to know, what do you weigh in space? Well, for a, a bunch of sixth graders, they, they asked some uh, pretty tough questions for us. Uh, you know, I think Nick and I probably have well over 30 years of education between the two of us. And uh, getting questions from sixth graders is always the most challenging uh, of them all. But I think Nick just demonstrated, and I think that we both uh, could show you that we, uh, we don't weigh much of anything while we're up here. Nice demonstration. But you know, the sixth graders will probably be Very interested to uh, probably be interested to hear, Mike, that although you don't weigh anything, you still have mass, you still have inertia. So if you start something moving, like if I take Bob and I move him towards the camera and it takes me a second to speed him up, I have to take that same second to slow him down because he is massive and just as we all are, he'll keep moving in one direction as long as there's no force acting on him. So there's really some interesting physics to observe up here, not just the weight, but also the mass. Thanks, Bob. Well done, boys. Uh, moving on to a different topic. Uh, your meals. We have this. This comes from uh, Chef Casey Wilson, and uh, he or she asks, the chef asks, what your meals consist of, and uh, is there anything specific that you ask to bring up that you're eating that's maybe a little bit uh, different? Thank you. 
Well, Mike, uh, I think there's uh, always a, a lot of interest in what type of food we actually eat on orbit, and it's a mixture of, of kind of camping food and military rations and uh, kind of dehydrated things. And so we've kind of got just about everything that you have on the ground just in a slightly different format that we either warm up or add water to and then warm up. So those are kind of the two things that we have. So nothing nothing too fancy as far as uh, chefs go uh, because we don't get to use all the, the, the fancy techniques. We just get to add water or add heat and uh, that's just about it. For me, um, I brought up some, some chocolates that I like and I also brought up some uh, breakfast rolls and some fresh fruit because uh, one of the things that you don't have very much of up here, like I said, with all rehydrated or, or food that you just warm up, uh, you don't get a lot of vegetables. So it's, uh, it is nice to, to taste citrus and uh, taste uh, fresh, fresh vegetables during the, the week or two that you're actually on orbit. And when we arrived with the, uh, for the station crew, we actually brought them quite a bit of uh, fresh food. Um, I don't think uh, you can see any more of it here. Actually, you can. There's some of it uh, stowed right above uh, Nick's head up here. There's some oranges and some apples and some avocados and some limids, so a lot of uh, fresh fruits that uh, only get delivered when there's a, a progress vehicle arriving or a space shuttle arrives to drop some of these things off. Okay, next question comes from uh, uh, Piotrus007, and they want to know how long do you prepare for, a, for your flight? How long do you guys prepare for your space flight? Well, we've been training for about a year, Mike. Um, we got assigned to this mission, I think, in uh, December of uh, 2008. Um, so we trained for just over a year before we launched. But in a way, we've been training for this for all of our lives. Bob and I are both engineers. Um, Bob's an Air Force flight test engineer, and I'm a, a, a civilian um, mechanical engineer, as you know, because we were at school together. Um, but we have literally been training to be astronauts for the last um, 30 or 40 years through our education. Um, one of the things I was struck by yesterday when I was doing my spacewalk is that uh, I think you probably can't feel really comfortable hanging from uh, hanging from a space station 200 miles above the planet going about 18,000 miles an hour unless you're really confident in the physics that you'll just keep going around the planet and won't fall. So in a way, I think we've been training a long, long time. Um, next question is from Pawan Mita. And uh, the question is, what types, of, uh, what types of experiments do you have on board? What experiments are you guys doing? I know you're busy with lots of stuff, but if you have any time for experiments, what are you doing? Well, Mike, uh, we do have a, a couple of exper experiments with us, and most of them are biological in nature, really, uh, as far as our flight goes. The space station is doing uh, quite a bit of, of a additional work. Uh, this is uh, an assembly mission to the space station, and so we're primarily focused on that. But the, the experiments that we do have, we have one which is a, a experiment to actually control viruses, and so we have a, a they're in a, a contained vessel, and uh, we cycle them through their process trying to activate them and then deactivate them uh, inside their canister to understand what the effects gravity have gravity has on those viruses. We also fly a, a, a big freezer. Um, it's called a glacier and it keeps uh, biological samples uh, really cold and also allows us to transfer new science materials either to the station or back down from the station. And so just uh, the day that we arrived, I, I opened up that freezer and exchanged uh, some samples that uh, Jeff Williams, the commander of the space station right now, had on board and uh, swapped those out. And I know there'll be a, a, a large number of uh, blood samples and other samples from the crews that have been on orbit to make sure that they've been healthy and understand the effects of uh, gravity. Uh, on their health uh, during their six-month stay on the space station. Boys, I think we have time for one more question, and uh, this one is uh, pertinent to our Twittering in space. Uh, this comes from Rich V. Miller. He wants to know what kind of computer do you use to send your tweets? And, Nick, are you able to tweet from space? As you know, Mike, I was tweeting uh, every day before we launched, and uh, unfortunately, I haven't had enough time to do, uh, do much tweeting from up here, although I will send another one out today. Um, when I send a tweet, I have to email it to a colleague on the ground who's agreed to post it for me. Um, but when the folks on the space station here send a tweet, they're able to do it directly via a live computer link with a machine down in Mission Control. Um, so they're actually able to uh, directly, if somewhat slowly, 
post their own tweets. And that's uh, something that uh, TJ Creamer, the ISS flight engineer up here now, um, has just uh, set up with help from colleagues on the ground. So that's a very exciting development for the tweeting community. Well, we know you're, you're busy, Nick, and anything you can send out, I know the folks would be interested in, uh, in reading eventually. And uh, we're, we're out of time, actually. Uh, and I know you guys are busy and have something else to do. It's been a real honor for me to work as your Capcom and to talk to you uh, this evening. It's, uh, it's been a real blast. And you guys look great, and you're doing a great job. And we're all proud of everything you guys are doing. doing anything job. you want to say to wrap up? You want to say hi to anybody anything or uh, you want to say to wrap uh, thank anyone? Or what, what do you got? Closing, closing thoughts for us. Gosh, the foot, I, we're going to thank everybody, uh, but we won't thank everybody. It's a bit like an Oscar speech if you do that. Um, I guess we'd like to thank the people who got us here, our trainers in Houston, um, and uh, the people at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab who uh, make the underwater training possible, and our flight control team on the ground. Um, those are the really important groups to thank. Um, I'd like to thank my family, too, for uh, putting up with my, uh, what should we call it, business travel, which can be demanding. And uh, Nick covered uh, the folks that that uh, have got us to this point and also been uh, supporting us while we're here on orbit. I'd also like to thank uh, my family and uh, my wife, Megan, who's also uh, a Capcom for some other other missions and uh, flew with you, Mike, uh, back to the, the Space Telescope a little bit, uh, a little while back. So I'd like to thank her specifically uh, as well. This is Mission Control Houston, a good view of the International Space Station with its new module here from the cameras in the exterior of the space shuttle. This is Mission Control Houston. You can see the crew assembling here in the Harmony node to begin their EVA-2 or Spacewalk 2 procedures review, going over the plan for tomorrow's spacewalk, or the spacewalk that begins later today, rather, and goes into tomorrow and uh, what everybody's different jobs for that spacewalk will be. Of course, mission specialist Bob Bankin and Nicholas Patrick will be going outside. Endeavor Station, this is the Associated Press. How do you hear me? Got you loud and clear. Hello, Marsha. Good morning, uh, Colonel Vertz, Captain Heyer. Um, talking to you this morning from the launching site. Both of you, tell me about your new room tranquility. What's the first impressions when you first floated inside? Yeah, it's so great to see it up here in space. Of course, we saw it uh, when it was still at the Kennedy Space Center before it launched. It looks a lot different here, especially now that we can float all over and use the entire volume instead of just in 1G. You're pretty much restricted to just a floor being a floor. But I will tell you, we're filling it up very quickly. <laughs> we're uh, loading all kinds of uh, equipment in there and starting to bring it to life. So it's going to look very different in just a short number of hours. Does it have that new room or new car smell and feel to it? And um, at least at first, was it stuffy, hot, cold, comfortable in there? Just a little bit of description of the um, ambiance. It, it definitely has the new spaceship smell. Um, it, it had a, uh, it, when we first opened it up, it had the same temperature as the station. And then probably for the first couple hours that we were in there, it started to get warm as we were all working, doing a lot of physical work in there. And uh, we didn't have all the ventilation hooked up yet. And now it's starting to feel more like the rest of the station. But it had a unique smell, um, uh, almost a space smell to it. Are you still limited to four uh, people in there at a time? Um, I know at first it seemed like there was some sluggish airflow going on. Has that been resolved? And do you still have to wear goggles and masks? Well, that's correct. When we first went in, uh, because there was no power or ventilation set up inside Node 3, it was dark and a bit stuffy. So we had to be careful and sample the environment, make sure it was safe, make sure there was uh, no particles floating around that might get into our eyes or cause problems. So we did have goggles and, and dust masks uh, as we went in until we can get the ventilation full up and working. And that's that's uh, on our schedule of uh, things to do, and we'll, we'll get that all all resolved soon and, and get it up and operating. 
Well, for each of you, you're both visiting the space station for the first time. Um, what's been the biggest surprise for each of you? Well, there, there's uh, uh, several differences between the shuttle and the station. Um, the first one you notice is just how big it is. One of the things that you can do is start at one end and push off and try and float, you know, as far as you can. And as a rookie, especially as a first-time visitor to the station, um, we're not very good and we tend to float up or hit the walls. But if you watch the station crew, these guys are real pros and they can push off and go for 50 or 100 feet without touching anything. So that, that requires some adaptation with your body to learn how to fly and float in space. Uh, so that's been a lot of fun. Okay, what, the, what are your thoughts? You know, we've seen so many beautiful pictures of the International Space Station. Every crew sends down just phenomenal images, but to see it for real, especially as we approach our rendezvous, it just, beyond description. It's just so uh, sharp, uh, very uh, high depth. It's kind of like the difference between seeing a very old analog type of a picture and the first time you ever see really super high definition. And here it is. It's, it's just such a large station and there's just so many capabilities on board. Uh, I think that was the, the biggest surprise was just how phenomenal it looked as we approached. Well, that leads me into my next question. With the shuttle uh, era winding down, the space station is going to be its legacy. And um, now that you've actually been there, um, are there, have your, do you have different, a different perspective on, on all this um, as being part of history? You know, Marsha, when we um, attach Node 3 and Kupla, the thing that that reminds me of is finishing the Transcontinental Railroad. That was a huge project that America really got behind. It was an international project. We had workers from around the world. And when it was done, it opened up the West um, to let our country become the nation that we are today. And in some ways, putting Node 3 and Tranquility on and the Cupola are um, the end of one phase of the space station, but it really, I think it's the beginning of a future of space exploration that a long time from now we'll look back on and, and see in a similar vein. Well, I'm, I'm just wondering is my last question, will the astronauts, will the two crews be doing anything special for Valentine's Day tomorrow? Um, maybe sharing a special meal or anything else? Thanks for reminding me. That's pretty funny because I was saying earlier uh, today that I didn't even really remember what day of the week it was or what day of the month because everything up here is all about either uh, Greenwich Mean Time or Mission Elapsed Time. So uh, that's that's how our days are built. And uh, we have to actually remind ourselves every now and then of uh, what day it is. So, yes, thanks for the reminder. Well, happy Valentine's Day to... It's easy for me to remember... Thanks. It's easy for me to remember Valentine's Day because my wife's birthday is tomorrow. So I have a birthday and a Valentine's Day, and it's hard for me to forget both of those. Well, well that's great. Well, um, I'm told I need to wind up. So um, good luck to all of you, and uh, Godspeed on your journeys home. Loud and clear. Hello, Bill. Hey, hi, Terry. Hi, Kay. It's uh, great to see you guys up there. Um, Obviously, I'm going to start with Node 3 today. Uh, they tell us that when the station, when the shuttle departs, the station is going to be 98% complete. How do you guys characterize that accomplishment? Uh, you know, I remember a few years ago, the space station processing facility was just packed with equipment, and, and now it's empty pretty much. Uh, what, do you all, what do you think about that? Like I said, um, I made the analogy with the Transcontinental Railroad, and I think it's an accomplishment that um, all Americans should be really proud of for, from what we've done up here and uh, really all of our international partners, um, Japan, Europe, Russia. There's been many countries involved in building the space station, and uh, I think it's something that uh, a, a lot of folks should be really proud of and, uh, and excited about. You know, seeing that module come out of the shuttle's cargo bay reminded a lot of folks about how much capability is going to be lost when the shuttle stops flying. 
And, uh, you know, given the administration's new budget, which obviously happened right before you guys took off, and the shift in emphasis, do either of you have any concerns about NASA's ability to keep the station flying through 2020? Well, you know, um, first of all, I'd like to say that I'm just so honored to be part of this fantastic team. And it is just unbelievable what this team, this international team, has done together, that we have put all these different high technical uh, pieces and parts all together and brought them up to space and put them together up here. We see many times things that are built in vastly different locations by several different companies and contractors and governments brought to space for the first time without ever being fit checked together, brought together here and uh, uh, put together and it works great. And this team just does a fantastic job and I'm sure they'll continue. Um, you know, looking ahead though, guys, there's a, there's a fair amount of angst, I guess, among the NASA troops about the budget, the new direction for NASA. Um, what do you guys have to say to everybody about where you think things are going? Well, I know it's a tough time, and uh, there's a lot of uncertainty out there, but um, from my personal point of view, we've, I've been focused on what's happening this afternoon and this evening, and I really haven't had time to think about what's going on too much in the future. But uh, I know that we have a very busy year of space shuttle flights, and uh, flying the space shuttle is a very difficult thing to do. It's a very complex machine, maybe the most complex machine that we've ever built. And uh, it's just really important right now for us to focus on flying the shuttle safely. Um, it's a really hard thing to get into orbit and, uh, and a hard thing to come back from orbit and, a, and a hard thing to operate here in orbit like we're doing. Like you mentioned, the shuttle has so much capability and it does so much. So I think in the near term, we just need to keep this our focus on that. Space ground two for the ARS rock. Well, let me ask you just one more along those lines, Terry. Uh, you know, obviously this, this shift to commercial vehicles is something that, that uh, is a big change. Or, or just because it's so hard to get into space, are you confident that private industry can, can do what needs to be done, both unmanned and manned, to support the station? I'm going to pass that one over to Kay. Yeah, I was just wondering, just because it is so difficult to get into space, the, the sheer challenge of all of this, how confident you guys are that private industry can step up both with unmanned cargo craft and the manned craft you'll eventually need uh, to continue supporting space station. Well, you know, again, uh, this is a phenomenal team, and NASA has been around for more than 50 years, and we faced a lot of challenges in the past. Uh, I remember uh, when we ended the Apollo program, and it took a while for us to, to get the shuttle program launched, but people were working on it. So I think that this is really going to lead to better things, just as we stepped up from Apollo to shuttle and the International Space Station. This is just a phase that we must go through sometimes. Uh, it would have been nice to have it maybe a little smoother, but uh, uh, this is something that we will meet at this challenge. Uh, NASA and its entire international team will make sure that we fly safely, and we're going to come up with something great. I'm sure that the next program is going to be wonderful. Thanks a lot, guys. They tell me i got to wrap, so have a safe flight, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you back on the ground in Florida. Thanks a lot. We'll see you. Endeavor, ISS, this is Reuters. How do you read me? Read you loud and clear. How do you read us? Very good. Thank you, Colonel Vertz, Captain Heyer. It's Chris Baltimore with Reuters in Houston. Uh, it's been a while since both of you have been on orbit. Uh, how has the experience been different for you uh, both this time around? Well, this is my first time, and uh, it's been amazing. It's different than what I thought it would be, um, a lot better. And, and it really, when you hear indescribable, that's really true, because um, you just can't put words to it. The, the Earth looks different than what I thought it would look. It has more colors to it and more tones, and it, it, it was just surprising. I've been looking at pictures of the Earth for my whole life, and, and uh, it was really surprising to see it, especially the first few days in orbit. There was a, a thin moon out, and um, 
I just saw some amazing things. The east coast of the U.S. at night, flew over Israel and Jerusalem one night with the moon setting right above it. And so those images are, are going to stick with me forever. The other thing that's different, and, um, and I knew it would happen, but it's, it's a lot of fun to get used to, is just floating and learning to not. There's a natural reaction that your body wants to push and touch and grab things. And uh, whenever you do that, you end up do it, you know, doing that and floating up just with a really small push. So you really have to learn. It's like learning how to walk again, only you have to learn in a few hours or a few days instead of years. Thank you. Uh, a question for Captain Heyer. Uh, the, the shuttle program is, is nearing its retirement with uh, four remaining missions after this one. Uh, for you and your team members, is, is this a feeling more uh, bitter or more sweet? Well, I'll tell you, I think it's going to hit me a little bit more after we land. Uh, we have been so focused on STS-130 and this flight and the tasks that we have to accomplish on this flight that we haven't really had a lot of time to reflect about it. But I'm sure that uh, when I get back and, and the reality of only four more flights sets in, it's, it's going to feel a little strange. But it's also an exciting time because it means that we're moving on to something else. So uh, I'm pretty excited to see what's going to come next. Thank you. A question for Colonel Verts. Uh, after uh, the shuttle is retired, uh, current plans call for U.S. astronauts to, to reach the space station uh, via privately run space taxis. Uh, is this a viable plan to you, and do you think that private industry can uphold the same standards of quality and safety that NASA has? Um, you know, my focus for last year has been on training for this flight, so I haven't, I'm not familiar at all with what plans uh, the commercial companies may have for building it. Um, I was aware of Orion and I worked on that some, um, but I'm sure that NASA is going to hold them to a very high standard, uh, that they're, it'll be safe, it'll, it'll uh, work to the best of our abilities to make it work. So I'm confident that NASA will make sure that there's high safety standards, but I haven't had a chance to, I'm not familiar with what types of designs or plans that they have right now. Thank you, uh, and, and maybe That's a question okay. for both of, both of you. Uh, uh, the current uh, NASA budget does away uh, with the, the, the Constellation program to put an American uh, vehicle on the moon. Uh, what's your take on this, uh, this priority shift uh, uh, going forward? Well, I have to echo what uh, Terry Virts just told you, and that's that we have been so focused on STS-130 that uh, personally, uh, for me, and I, I'm sure for the rest of our crew, that we really haven't even been reading the news or, or looking at the details of all of that. I, I know there's a lot of um, uh, discussion going on about that right now, but I'm really just not up to speed on that. But we can sure talk about this mission, STS-130, and what we're going to accomplish while we're here at the International Space Station. Uh, you bet. Maybe uh, you could give me a few impressions about the new uh, Tranquility mode and, uh, Node and uh, what, what it's looking like and how it's shaping up. We were able, able to open the hatch and go in today, and it, starting off it was dark and just a little bit uh, stuffy, if you will, because there was no uh, air circulation going on, and we're in the process of setting all that up. So as we are going in there now and bringing new equipment inside, we are wearing little headlamps and carrying flashlights and, and uh, little portable fans and, until we get everything all up and running. But that's going to be soon, and it's just going to be a fantastic uh, module for uh, the folks on the International Space Station. Very good. I know that uh, your crew is working some issues with uh, uh, getting the, uh, the, the proper um, equipment for uh, sealing the, the, the cupola onto the Tranquility node. Do you uh, envision that uh, creating any problems for uh, completing that, that part of the installation? Yes, we just noticed um, there's a cover that we were going to put on the outside hatch of node 3, uh, and we cover that hatch up as we move the cupola off of it, and then we're going to move another module called PMA3 onto that location. And the ground is deciding right now um, how they want to proceed. In fact, that just happened, as you know, a few hours ago. While Kay and I were installing it, uh, we found out that it didn't fit. There's no immediate, the, the, both modules are in great shape, and so it's just a matter of deciding how we're going to proceed at this point. Colonel Verts, Captain Heyer, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time. 
Thanks a lot, and I uh, hope you're having a great time back there on Earth.